Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us tonight and welcome to the Faculty of Science Information Night. I'm Nancy Chibri. I'm the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs and Student Affairs for the Faculty of Science, and I'll be your host for tonight's event. We are so pleased that you're considering the Faculty of Science as that next step in your educational journey. In a few moments, I'm going to introduce you to our panel. Um, but before we, we begin, though, we would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that the University of Calgary, located in the heart of Southern Alberta, both acknowledges and pays tribute to the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Sisika, the Bigani, and the Ghana First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda including Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nations. In addition, the city of Calgary's homeland to Métis Nation of Alberta, District 5 and 6. So I would like to take this opportunity to, to note that the University of Calgary is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, and that traditional Blackfoot name is Mokinsis, which we now call the city of Calgary. Uh, anytime we um, say a land acknowledgement, it's very important that we reflect on what it means and whether that be our own personal journey or the journey of others. Um, it really is about the land and the people. And it's important that we are kind to each other and also kind to the land so that we can pass it on for generations to enjoy. Uh, so today was a lovely day here in Calgary. And for those, for those of you who are zooming in from different places in Calgary, in Alberta, Canada, outside of Canada, I hope you can take a moment to reflect on who was first on your on the land that you are now a guest and that um, we do our part every day to make sure, again, as I said, that the next generation is able to enjoy it. And so next thing I'd like to talk about, which is pretty exciting, is this past September, uh, the Faculty of Science unveiled its newest department, Earth, Energy and Environment. It's focused on getting science done to solve key challenges like energy security, climate change and water security. This new interdisciplinary department will be the first of its kind in Canada, and you can be a part of it. Um, so this new uh, department will bring talented graduates into Alberta's vital industries, including energy, ge geoscience and agriculture. So we just have a little video to play for you. From the highest mountains to the deepest oceans, the earth is a place of wonder that supports life. The world, however, is changing. From evolving energy needs to the climate crisis, we are facing challenges Addressing these will require diverse perspectives, creativity, innovation, and leading-edge science. Earth at UCalgary is driving change. We're building a community of inventors, dreamers, and doers assembled from diverse fields, disciplines, and backgrounds. The foundation of our community is our students, and we are preparing them to be ahead of tomorrow Together, our community will tackle Earth's problems. Together, we will get science done. We are Earth at UCalgary. That's a pretty exciting news. Um, I just wanna talk a little more before we get into our panel about you being a science student and what you will have access to here in the Faculty of Science. So we have multiple field stations, which are overseen by the University of Calgary uh, or in collaboration with other universities. These research and educational facilities are si situated in natural or remote environments, providing scientists, researchers, and students with the infrastructure and resources needed to conduct field work, experiments, studies in various disciplines. With a visionary approach, transdisciplinary research takes center stage. Um, Imagine scholars from uh, various faculties converging to explore the intersection of human, animal, space, and environmental health. It's nurturing a community of thinkers who understand the intricate dance suits and the living, breathing world outside the classroom. So as you can see here on this slide, this is WA Ranches. It's located about 50 kilometers northwest of Calgary. Um, here is where academia meets 
the untamed beauty of the Canadian landscape. Uh, we have over 19,000 acres, which is pretty impressive, that the University of Calgary prou proudly stands as the sole proprietor of 1,000 head of, ca of a cattle operation. It's a living laboratory and classroom like no other in the country. There's a Banfield Marine Science Center. Um, this is run with in collaboration with the University of Victoria, the University of British Columbia, Simon Fraser University, and the University of Alberta. And it's located in the village of Banfield on the west coast of Vancouver Island, as you can see from the slide. Um, it's a research and teaching facility. It plays a crucial role in marine biology and ocean oceanography uh, studies. Uh, the center provides a unique coastal environment for scientists and students to conduct research on marine life, ecosystems, and environmental processes. We have another field station called Barrier Lake Field Station, and that's located in Kananaskis Valley, about 80 kilometers west of Calgary. Um, here, the pursuit of knowledge is mostly woven into the tapestry of nature. And you can see from the picture, it's just absolutely stunning. Um, this is a facility to explore, learn, and innovate against the backdrop of the Rocky Mountains. There's classrooms, labs, a library, meeting rooms, and much, much more. Our other field station is R.B. Miller, and that's located in Sheep River Provincial Park, and that's about 110 kilometers southwest of Calgary. And as you can see from the picture too, it stands as a beacon of sustainable exploration. It's newly constructed, off-grid, it's a cozy little retreat uh, where the pulse of scientific discovery harmonizes with nature. You can see that it's powered by the sun and the energy efficient building stands as a testament to eco-conscious living, which in the Faculty of Science, we are all for. And then also, did you know that the Faculty of Science is the only faculty in Canada to have its own astrophysical observatory? So the Rothney Astrophysical Observatory, we call it the RAO, and that's located in Prudis, uh, which is about 20 kilometers southwest of Calgary. And at this heart of this astronomical, astronomical haven um, lies some pretty incredible instruments. Um, we have one that's 1.8 meters tall, and we'll have uh, Matt talk about it later. Uh, but it, it's, I would say it's the largest optical telescope uh, in all of Canada. And with this, you can see, you can explore the universe. Um, the RAO invites both seasoned researchers, students, and curious minds from the general public to, to peer into the vast expanse of space. Um, so that's just a few of the things that the Faculty of Science is connected to. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have our panelists now. We'll, we'll get them to turn on their cameras. <laughs> um, and what we're going to do is uh, I have each is going to give a two minute overview with maybe some pictures uh, about their program and why you should join their program. And then we're going to open it up to some questions from those who are joining us tonight. And we have some moderators uh, join us, and that will be undergraduate advisor Carla Heaton and our student recruitment ambassador Kara Schmittler. So I first like to say that we're going to have uh, Ahmed is joining us. Ahmed Haji Gassami. He is in. He's going to be talking about biology and biochemistry. We have Leanne Wu, who will talk about data science, computer science. We then have Brandon Kotreski. Who will talk about Earth, Energy, and Environment, our new department. Uh, we have math and stuff. It's going to be me. <laughs> uh, we have chemistry and natural sciences. Uh, that will be Bronwyn Wheatley, who will talk about that. And then finally, to finish it off, we have Matt Taylor for physics and astronomy. Okay, so if you have a question again, please uh, put it in the chat, and we hopefully will be able to get to it. But we are limited by time tonight, as there is a, another session taking place at 7 p.m. So we'll start off for each panelist. In two minutes or less, what are the top three reasons why someone should choose your program? All right, hello everyone. So as uh, Nancy mentioned, I'm a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences, which offers a diverse range of programs from the very large in plant biology and zoology to the very small in microbiology and biochemistry. So I'm gonna take this opportunity to highlight some of the unique features in our program so we have some uh, new faculty and, and teaching faculty that really uh, has a diverse set of skills in understanding uh, what we call lipid biology. So that's, in other words, uh, the biology of fats, uh, where they're located, how they're synthesized, and more importantly, what are the differences between diseased and healthy individuals uh, when it comes to their um, you know, fat deposits or, fat, uh, or lipid biology. Uh, next slide, please. 
We also have a, a, a unique uh, biophysical tools to examine the molecular, the finer molecular structures of proteins and DNA and understand their intricacies between how they interact and, and uh, inform each other. And again, trying to understand the basics of, uh, of their uh, mechanism in terms of diseases and uh, how we can inform clinicians um, in the future. Next slide, please. We also have a, a very unique program here at the University of Calgary. Uh, we are one of the largest centers for understanding the metabolomics. Uh, so these are very, very small molecules now, and, uh, and they're uh, diverse uh, interconnection between the society, uh, individuals from uh, our genetics to our, how drugs interact with the small molecules. And again, we have some of the most advanced tools uh, in the world to study these interactions. So with that, I'll leave it to my other colleagues. Hey everybody, I guess I'm up next with computer and data science. Uh, and what I want to point out about these fields is that technology is everywhere, right? So you can look around you right now at your computer, your phone, your TV, speakers, doorbells, and it goes on and on. They're all internet connected. Uh, they're all packed full of features that we would call smart. And it really is changing the world, right? We've seen that in the last year as AI and machine learning have been in the spotlight. Uh, so this image that we're looking at here is even actually generated using AI. I used Adobe Firefly to make this. Um, these generative AI models definitely have their flaws, but we're going to see them to continue to improve. And so what we see in computer science in the, in the next slide um, is how we're going to improve on these artificially intelligent systems and other computer systems around them. So what computer science is really about is how we describe the world around us and create descriptions of the world in a way that we can break this down into the kinds of problems that a computer actually knows how to solve. And, and that's actually kind of really challenging and, and really uh, satisfying when you get that right. Uh, these problems are wide ranging and cover the whole gamut of science and human endeavors. So um, you know, when our friends in biology are talking about databases, those are developed by computer scientists as um, a basis for their work. And, and that's actually where I started my career, actually, in database development. Um, and if you think about it, um, and we can go to that last slide, um, I've got um, that interdisciplinary trend carries over into data science, right, where we're looking generally at techniques to analyze data using statistical and computational techniques, but incorporate the knowledge that individual fields have developed using their own su uh, subject matter. Um, so it's not just about machine learning and other kinds of AI, but you can see in this picture, you can empower people to better see the world around them using data. So what this is, is a map of Calgary and all the trees that are owned by the city. And if I told you that every single color represents a different kind of tree, you can start seeing the patterns of how the city's chosen to plant trees um, throughout the entire city. Um, so I'll, I'll pass that off to our next panelist now. Thank you so much. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, I'm Brandon from the Department of Earth Energy and Environment. Uh, so the first thing I think is really exciting about programs uh, in our department is that all of them include opportunities for experiential learning through fieldwork, uh, both through our field school courses, as well as undergraduate research opportunities. Uh, those take place in locations both near Calgary, such as the BGI Institute uh, in the Kananaskis, as well as locations abroad, such as our Hawaiian Volcanoes Field School and our Carbonate Geology uh, which takes place in the Bahamas. Uh, the second thing uh, that I think uh, is really exciting about programs uh, in Earth Energy Environment uh, is that the BSc Geology, BSc Geophysics, and also the Geoscience Concentration in Environmental Science can lead uh, to professional designation as a professional geoscientist or PGO through APEGA uh, or other provincial uh, governing bodies uh, under the umbrella of Geoscientists Canada. Uh, so those programs it, it, um, include courses that meet the Geoscientists Canada knowledge requirements. Um, and then that gets you on the right foot for a professional designation that can set you apart in a number of careers. Um, and then the third thing, uh, which I think is really exciting about uh, programs in the earth energy environment, uh, is that we're actually going through sort of a uh, revisioning and redesign process to modernize the curriculum in all of our programs uh, with a new emphasis on 
data science um, and how that can be, how the tools of data science can be applied uh, in the field of geoscience, environmental science, and energy science, uh, and specifically re related to the responsible use um, of natural resources that uh, that are on the earth. Okay, so I'll pass it off to our next panelist. Well, that would be me. Thanks, Brandon. So I'm, I'm here to talk about math and stats. Um, so our program really emphasizes interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, providing students with opportunities. So we want always want to see how you can apply mathematical and statistical concepts to real world problems. Um, we have very close ties with Cummings School of Medicine, Veterinary Medicine, and other faculties on campus. We have uh, collaborations with other departments and research centers, uh, insurers, that students gain practical experience and they can see the direct impact of their skills um, in fields, various fields, such as biology, chemistry, economics, computer science, and, and the list goes on. Um, we, the program also maintains strong connections with industry partners. Um, we have industrial workshops, so you can come and uh, to these workshops where industry will bring, bring a problem and then you'll sit down with colleagues and the colleagues could be master students, could be your professors, and you're trying to solve the problems that are impacting industry. Um, there, we There's also facilitating network opportunities, internships, cooperative education experience. Um, we give you real world exposure. Um, for students for, and to help you get gain successful careers upon graduation. Uh, we focus on applying mathematical and statistical skills to address practical challenges in various uh, professional sectors. Um, and we have some of renowned faculty members who are leaders in their respective fields um, and that students have access to cutting edge research opportunities, um, allowing them to contribute to advancements in these disciplines. Um, our, our, one of the really cool things about our program is it's highly flexible. So it allows students to tailor their education to align with their specific interests and make career aspirations. Um, you can choose from a variety of specializations to create a unique academic path um, that meets your goals. Uh, and this adaptability sets, I believe sets our program apart, ensuring that graduates uh, possess a well-rounded skill set. Thank you. Hello everyone and thank you for coming. Um, so in natural sciences, you'll choose not one but two sciences to follow. Uh, so this naturally gives you breadth in your studies and it leads towards interdisciplinary work. So on the slide here you see if you're interested in energy, uh, so you might want to uh, specialize in energy science, but you also like the math program that we just heard about. Well, you would select those two concentrations in the natural sciences program. You would complete a single degree uh, that encompasses them both. Um, so if you move ahead, um, if your interest, on the other hand, was caught by your earth energy and environment and also the computer science, data science programs that we've seen, you choose this combination, something in geoscience, something sort of in computer science. And again, at the end of your four years, you would have a degree in both. Uh, there's another combination you could try. Um, maybe you like the look of biology uh, that we saw quite recently and the physics and astronomy that's coming up. So again, that's what you would choose. Uh, and so finally, in total, there are 36 combinations that natural sciences allows for. Uh, it's a program that's flexible. It allows students to create degrees that they choose. Um, so you, in addition to this, you would choose two custom-made natural sciences courses. Uh, one is about research design and statistics. And the other one covers science and society. And then finally, you'll complete your degree with a capstone course. Uh, so depending on what is of most interest. Uh, there might be hands-on research. Uh, you might have uh, an extensive literature research. You might have a look at what it's like to write a grant uh, for future research. You might have a look at ethics applications. You might have a look at safety considerations. So that's for natural sciences. Um, if it's chemistry you're interested in, you would take classic analytical, inorganic, organic, and physical chemistry courses, and they're also connected to nanoscience. So I'll hand this off to our last panelist. Yeah, hey everyone, uh, thanks for coming out. Um, that was actually a fantastic segue into astrophysics. Uh, my name is Matt Taylor. I'm actually one of the uh, newest faculty in uh, in our department. And uh, astronomy, as an astrophysics degree, is uh, is a really fantastic blend of actual multiple uh, disciplines. So most of your degree is, in fact, physics and math, not astronomy. 
So you do a lot of your uh, your foundational work, uh, learning about all the physics and mathematical tools that we need to study the universe around us. And we really finished the last couple of years in most of our uh, astronomy related courses and uh, and really start to specialize in these fields. So the astronomy group here is a, is a tight group, uh, a tight knit group of, of uh, people who are studying the universe at different wavelengths. So what I'm featuring in this, uh, in this picture here is actually the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory, one of Canada's premier uh, astrophysical uh, 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 instruments that we use to study the universe. And so my colleagues use these radio telescopes to study anything from uh, the mysterious magnetic field that uh, weaves its way through our own galaxy to studying the interstellar medium or the stuff between the stars that uh, that lies between all the stars that make up our galaxy and other galaxies uh, throughout the universe. Um, and so we don't just use these giant radio telescopes. Uh, I myself actually use giant optical telescopes, so telescopes that study the universe in light that we can see with our own eyes. And so we use uh, uh, giant telescopes that Canada has stakes in in places like Hawaii and Chile to uh, to study the, the universe in different ways. Uh, can just go to the next slide. And so as Nancy uh, alluded to earlier, we're uh, we're the home of the Rothney Astrophysical Observatory. This is a, a really, really special place uh, and unique to University of Calgary. So most Canadian universities do have their own telescopes. But only University of Calgary has its own really uh, um, specialized facility outside uh, outside of the city of Calgary, uh, where we can actually have lots and lots of opportunities for students to really get their hands dirty, get uh, a lot of experiential learning, uh, playing with instruments, uh, studying the universe, and uh, and using this facility to to really learn how astrophysical research is done. And so this is the home of, uh, as Nancy said, the largest optical telescope in Canada. This is the AR Cross Telescope, so featured in the uh, in the central large dome there. And so this uh, this is a really really special place that uh, undergrads who who join our program have uh, have specialized access to. So we'll go to the next slide. But the research that we do here isn't actually just limited to the ground. Uh, we, uh, we, some of our faculty members, myself included, actually use uh, the giant space telescopes that uh, some of you may have heard of. So this includes the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, I myself got time to use it uh, to study actually the, the properties of massive black holes that, uh, that are in star clusters in faraway galaxies. We also use uh, where we had a, a major contribution to the Astrosat Space Telescope. So we tested some of the detectors in uh, in a laboratory here on campus, and we're planning to uh, to uh, do future work on uh, on the next generation of UV space telescopes right here on campus. So we actually have physical labs where you can do work, as well as gathering data from space and from the ground to uh, to learn about how modern astrophysics is done. So uh, yeah, thanks for for coming out, and uh, we'd we'd love to help you uh, have you join our our department. I'll hand this off now to uh, to Nancy. Thanks, Matt. So if everyone wants to turn on their camera, uh, sorry, I, I believe I told you to turn it on too early, but that's okay. Um, so if you can turn it on now, this is great. Okay, we're, so we're going to go in the same order, and I have another question, which often comes up when we have these type of events, um, is what careers can the program lead to. So I'd like each of you to give two exciting examples. Now the quiz, do you remember your order? <laughs> sure, I guess uh, I'll yeah. start. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I touched upon a lot of the things that are involved in healthcare. Um, so healthcare professionals typically uh, very often pick something along the lines of biological sciences because there's quite a lot of overlap in terms of their degrees and the things that they take with them uh, in the clinic as healthcare professionals, but it doesn't have to be um, any healthcare degree. It could also be uh, government, agriculture. Like I said, if you do a degree in, in the plant biology, you learn a lot that could be very useful for Agriculture Canada or and so on and so forth. So the opportunities are endless, but you said two, so I'll just pick government and healthcare. Awesome. We'll pass okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to highlight information security and privacy because that's actually my research area. 
um, and you might think it's all hackers and it's always a navy blue hoodie um, in a dark room typing. It's actually not that. It's super collaborative. Uh, there's a lot of teamwork involved. You actually have to know a lot about uh, the way people think and the way people use computers, which is really interesting, I actually uh, think. And, and so that opens up avenues for work um, wherever you want. You know, it could be consulting. It could be with government. It could be with large corporations, um, small corporations, NGOs. So, so there's a lot of opportunities there. And I, I would also just want to point out um, um, anytime you get to work in Calgary's thriving and growing technology scene, I, I think we're, we're at a really interesting point right now where that scene is starting to uh, really uh, grow and fulfill its potential. And, and it's really an incredible time to be working in technology in Calgary um, in any industry. And, and, you know, we send our graduates, you know, to fashion, to retail, like places you wouldn't ever expect. So um, that's something I really would love to highlight here. Okay. Brandon. Brandon. Yeah, so, uh, you know, like other programs, I think there's tons of opportunities uh, in earth energy environments. So a couple of examples are uh, environmental scientists or environmental geoscientists who might do anything from uh, monitoring how things like glaciers and water resources are impacted by climate change. Uh, so, for example, in Calgary, uh, some some people might remember the big flood event we had in 2013. And so environmental scientists, environmental geoscientists might have been involved in understanding how that happened, uh, you know, when we might expect an event like that to happen again, and how we can protect ourselves from it. Um, another broad area of careers uh, one might be involved in coming out of uh, earth energy environment is what I'll call broadly energy scientist, which could actually come with a variety of labels like uh, geologists, geophysicists, uh, or, you know, also environmental scientists. But what I'm referring to with energy science is anything related to understanding how do we locate energy resources, how do we safely and responsibly extract them, um, and how do we uh, deal with impact of energy use, such as carbon sequestration. So for example, uh, within the Department of Earth Energy Environment, one of the research sites that we have is the CAMI Institute, uh, which is specifically set up for uh, doing research on monitoring uh, carbon injection and carbon sequestration, uh, such as CO2 gas and uh, methane gas, uh, and the different techniques we can use to monitor those types of sites. So uh, lots of uh, interesting opportunities coming out of this uh, program, I think. And I have, my background is statistics, so you can be a statistician. Um, there's actual science. Um, anything that involves data, you you could be a data scientist. Was already mentioned, uh, biostatistician. Uh, the highest employer for mathematicians tends to be in business and finance. Um, but a really cool job is I know actually know some former graduates who are working for CSIS. So I don't know if you know what CSIS is, but it's the the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. So it would be equivalent to the CIA in the US. So that is, that's pretty cool. Um, and then, so I think the, one of another uh, employer in general is anything to deal, do, deal with science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, mathematicians work closely alongside engineers. Um, and, and even as Brandon said, we have uh, environmental, our, our version would be environmental statistician. So you're analyzing environmental data to ask, to assess you know, the impact of human activities, uh, model climate changes, and inform and environmental policies. So as I mentioned earlier, we if you're a mathematician, you actually work closely with all of the disciplines because at some point they involve math, they involve data. Um, yeah, so I mean, everyone always thinks, well, maybe I can be a math teacher, but you could be a health informatics specialist. So, I've gone on, but there are many jobs available uh, to anyone with a mathematics or statistics background. So I'll pass it on. Hey, so based on the conversations I've sort of had most recently with students, um, a few have been very much involved in uh, going into the area of nuclear power. Uh, so that is something that is of interest to them. And uh, they've had the skill set coming out of natural sciences to go into that area of industry, that area of study. Um, the other one, and this might be of particular interest to you, anonymous attendee, but someone did indeed go into the Masters of Biotech. So there are many other options available, but those are the two that I've come across most recently. 
Yeah, so this is uh, this is such a common question for astronomy. Um, what can you do with an astronomy degree other than look through telescopes? And uh, and like everyone else, um, it really comes down to the analysis of data. Um, astronomy is plagued in the modern era with having way too much data and not nearly enough people to work on it. Uh, as an example, next year, there's a survey starting called the Legacy Survey of Space and Time down in Chile that's going to be taking a picture of the entire sky every three days. So this is basically going to be building up a movie of the entire night sky. And that is a lot of data, terabytes and terabytes of data. And so we need people with skills to be able to take that data and actually organize it and analyze it in a very... Uh, um, understandable, meaningful way. And so these are the skills that you generally develop in an astrophysics program. So we're talking data science, we're talking st statistics. Increasingly, it's machine learning to help take the, uh, the, the labor off the human uh, part of the analysis. And so personally, I've known uh, uh, a number of folks who have left astronomy and gone on to other fields very, very successfully. One uh, works for the Ministry of Health in BC. Um, right, he was an astronomer, and now he works for the Ministry of Health. Uh, another became a senior data scientist at uh, Ernst and Young in in Boston. And so there's uh, there's a lot that you can uh, you can do with an astrophysics degree. The skills that you gain in that are very very transferable into a number of different uh, a different number of different eras in the in the modern world. So I saw one question that came up in the chat was what degree basically or pre med would prepare me for my MCAT. I just want to let you know an interesting story. I met with a student probably last week. Um, they were in their third year of a math degree, and their goal was to go to med school. As long as you have the key courses required for medical school, which would be your biology, first year biology, your chemistry, and, and some of your some second year courses in chemistry and biology, which many students in, let's say, math or uh, geophysics could take as well, you can apply to medical school that prepares you for the MCAT. Um, so I thought it was fascinating because what this student was gonna do is they weren't necessarily gonna be working with patients, but they wanted to use their research in their background in math to help practitioners, where's modeling data so that behind the scenes, making things more efficient for them. And so they felt that having the math background and understanding the training that goes into being a doctor would really benefit doctors in general, because not too many people are uh, that are doctors also have a math background or they have a physics background. I met another student and they had an engineering background and they had applied to medical school. So, um, Oh, we get this all the time. Uh, Leanne, do you want to take this one up in terms of, and this is this is good for everyone to know, what is the difference between software engineering and computer science? Okay, yeah, I get this one all the time. Um, so there are a lot of similarities between both programs at the University of Calgary. Um, um, a lot of what software engineering has developed has been really in parallel and, and sometimes in partnership with computer science. So you'll see a lot that's similar. Uh, what I would say just from my observations is what we're focused on is really setting you up so um, you can continue doing computer science for not just you know, six months after you graduate or five years after you graduate, but uh, 10 or 20 years, right? Because we're really focused on uh, the problem solving and the ability to develop um, abstractions based on what we observe in the real world. Um, engineering is a, a little bit of a different focus, right? They're, they're focused on building things. So they want to give you the tools and techniques that work right now. Um, and, and so what I've sort of observed from software engineering grads and computer science graduates is um, the outcomes in industry often look the same, but what changes is the kind of work you're doing. So um, engineering uh, students will very often end up in management because they're they're sort of at a disadvantage in terms of being able to maintain those technical skills over time. Whereas, you know, if I if I see a programming language, I know I can sit down, you know, in three weeks, I can figure it out more or less. Um, and, and so I think that's kind of the, the primary difference. I would also note that at the University of Calgary, there is a a differential in terms of the fees that you pay and that might actually factor into um, some of the decisions you'll have to make over the next year. I know that's a reality for a lot of our students. Um, so I hope that answers the question. 
I maybe want to emphasize too that in computer science, you can do a concentration in software engineering. So computer science, I believe, allows you more flexibility in terms of the directions you want to go with. Yeah, we, we get more fun options for sure, because yeah. you, you're actually um, not really lit limited in terms of the kinds of options you can take so you, you can see what interests you and, and go do that and and build that um, not only to support your academics but your own development as an adult and as a future citizen right um, you know we we need well-rounded adults to tackle a lot of the problems we're seeing especially with AI and machine learning so um, I think it's really healthy for students to learn as much as they can about the world around us really so and to add one more thing too, um, in science, there's quite a bit of flexibility in the sense that we encourage students to go and explore, to take on minors. Um, so let's suppose you go into computer science and you think software engineering is where you want to be. Well, you can apply for the concentration or maybe you just want to dabble a bit, take a few courses and that's okay. Or maybe once you get into computer science, you're going, you know what, maybe I want to switch to natural sciences. And that's where our advisors come in. We I can't remember the percentage, but it's a large percentage of science students actually change their program within science. So they might start off in biology and move to chemistry or vice versa. I moved from biology into math. And I don't know if any of the panelists have experienced similar things where you start off in one degree and then move to another, or maybe you took, and you can also, the nice thing is that let's say you're in computer science, you're going, you took a bunch of courses, you're going, yeah, I think that's the end for me. I want to, I'm more interested in biology. There's a way that you could switch to biology and then the courses that you use in computer science, they could count as a minor or they can just count towards your biology degree. That's the nice thing about science. And as I said, we want you to go explore other fields in science, uh, music, arts, drama, Haskane, you know, business courses, go and explore and you can count them towards your degree. And that's a really great thing about a science degree. Yeah. And, and I'd also note that um, as has recently um, been ruled by the Alberta government, um, the way that uh, people in industry see the term software engineering is not necessarily how uh, engineering accreditation bodies or engineering schools would see engineers. So you can do a computer science degree and still go into uh, what are broadly referred to as software engineering or even data engineering roles. Um, and I am a little biased, but I think we we provide excellent preparation for that. Um, I want to hear about cool chemistry stuff, if yeah, that's but, okay, because like nope. I am, I I can't wait. So yeah, that's let's what I was go, Bronwyn. Ask. Let's go. This is gonna be cool. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, so, you know, uh, starting in first year, you will find yourself in the wet lab. Uh, so there's all kinds of stuff that will go on there. Um, a lot of the things they're, they're trying to um, help you develop some of those sort of basic research skills, um, almost sort of an intuition, like what are you looking for as evidence that a reaction has taken place, that sort of thing. Um, what sort of information is important to be looking for and to record as you move forward? So yeah, we have, we start out with labs right away, um, five of them in Chem 201, five of them in Chem 203. And that's typically what students would take in their first year. Um, and then second year, we dump you right into organic and analytical. Uh, so you start right away analytical. You will be, um, you know, titrations, obviously, but you're going to start looking at some um, instruments and whatnot. Um, organic, again, you're heading straight into organic synthesis. What are the classic techniques that are used? You're now going to start to make molecules and characterize them and move forward. Um, as you progress up through, you'll be working with things that are increasingly more um, we'll just say dangerous, uh, you know, require a bit more safety consideration and are a lot more um, exploratory or experimental. Um, so you might sort of branch out and you might be the only one in the lab who's synthesizing a particular structure, or you might go into nanoscience and you'll be looking at something that, you know, didn't used to be part of a very conventional uh, chemistry um, uh, chemistry project. So yeah, lots of stuff. And, and, you know, even just something as simple as a lot of students tend to tie dye their uh, lab coats. So, you know, no sense in all those brown streaks showing up gradually as your degree progresses, you might as well start it with a beautiful lab coat and then the stains don't show up so much. You're okay. muted. Yeah, I'm mute. Thank you. See, I knew that was going to happen at one point <laughs> tonight. Uh, so Ahmed, uh, someone wants to know what research opportunities is UFC involved in right now, so specifically for bio biological science, biochemistry students? 
Um, yeah, it's kind of tough to narrow down. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of research being done uh, here. I've, I've just touched upon a few. There's there's lots of research being done in all, in anthropology, from zoology to biochemistry, and, and all. we have a large number of research staff and teaching staff uh, that are engaged in these activities. So there's there's tons. There's just uh, yeah. So there's and it's very easy to get involved in these opportunities and. Um, you simply, you know, take a, usually I recruit myself, recruit a lot of students from my own courses. I have two honor students in my lab right now. There, there were students of mine uh, in the winter term. So it's very easy to connect with a lot of the profs. I think you'll find most professors very easy to connect with and get in touch with. So if you're interested in research early on, it's just a matter of talking to them and, and getting an opportunity that fits you. Yeah, and I mean, we're connected. We have researchers that go to the Royal Terrell Mu Museum. We have, they go to the zoo. So there's opportunity, vet med, as I mentioned earlier, uh, coming school of medicine. There's lots of opportunities where your supervisor doesn't have to be from the faculty of science. It's wherever, wherever your interest lies. If you can find a researcher um, at the faculty, in not the faculty, but the University of Calgary, um, there we have awards such as the Pure Awards, and that's for undergraduate research that takes place during the summer. It's paid. Um, again, once if you if you have something you're interested in, and you talk to a professor, and he might he or she they might have an interesting topic that you could work on, then you would apply for this opportunity. There's also um, funding through the federal government through NSERC, things like that. Uh, another, yep, yeah, another question. I think we had what can you do with a neuroscience degree besides medical school? Uh, I don't know if you're aware of the Hotchkiss Brain Institute. So you can go on to be a researcher with the Hotchkiss Brain Institute or, um, and, and maybe Amit, you can talk about this too in terms of anything that's related to biology. Um, you could be go, if you have some computer programming, um, you could be a, you could look at neural networks. You could work alongside computer scientists. Uh, we have, I believe some pe people in physics that uh, do research in neuroscience as well. If you want to chime in, Matt if, or Ahmed, at any point, please do so. I don't I actually. This is um, a good point, and one of the things I I, I was amazed, amazed at is some of the industries that you may not even think of how they hire. For example, I uh, I knew a neuroscientist who was working for Lululemon. Um, you'd be surprised <laughs> how so many uh, industries are actually hiring in data science, physics, and astronomy. So you don't need to necessarily need to be stuck on this idea that you know if you do physics, you have to be a physicist. Mm -hmm. uh, you know you can work in a very diverse range of industries and governments and so on. And neuroscience is one of these fields that it really depends on what you did during your research or your undergrad. If you specialize maybe in the more big data component, then you can really go into the data stream aspects of neuroscience. Or if you became a sort of a neuroscientist uh, focusing more on the molecular biology and molecular physiology. So it really depends, um, I guess. Had to be a vague answer, but that's... Yeah. I did think of one example too. One of our neuroscience students was a dancer. So they did a project on how the brain and the physical movement work in dance, which was really neat. And I think they went on now, to, uh, they're now doing a master's in research on that and in movement. So yeah, there's lots of areas it, it can take you. Let's see, uh, we have a question about, can you talk a little more about data science? From my understanding, this is its first year at UFC as a major. Yeah, that's right. I'm actually getting ready to, to teach our first students in the program, and it is really exciting. Um, so this is a collaboration between the Departments of Computer Science and Mathematics and Statistics. So um, I've gotten to work a lot with Nancy on this one. Um, and what we're doing here is we're combining computational techniques um, with sort of the the statistic, the rigor of statistics to really be able to, to crunch data in interesting ways. And we're also combining that with an opportunity for students to really flexibly integrate um, understanding of a, a third area of knowledge. So what we call subject matter expertise um, into their program. So that'll be in the form of a six course concentration that you can take from uh, selected topics in science and arts. So um, I talked to people in geography today. They're super excited about this program. I know sociology is as well. Um, and, you know, there, there are ways to kind of do data science in, in ways that um, 
definitely didn't exist when I was in in undergrad because honestly if I'd been able to combine computation with English like that would have been it for me like I get to read and I get to do like nerdy things like it, it, it wouldn't have been more perfect so so that's what the program is going to look like there's going to be a lot of sort of hands-on project-based learning um, there is a capstone in our final year you, you'll have the option to do internships and things like that so um, we're, we're really looking forward to to kind of seeing this as kind of a really like transdisciplinary collaborative program, um, not just for students, but for the people teaching it. So it's kind of a really exciting time to be involved with that. Yeah, I was going to give you a shout out to the people joining us. Uh, Leanne was the leader in the development of our data science uh, major. So shout out to you, Leanne. Um, let's see some of the other questions. Oh, chemistry. Um, what would I mostly do in the program? Would it be anything similar to chemical engineering? Right. Um, so I, I can't speak too much for chemical engineering, but in chemistry, um, so you, you'd start with general chem, and then there's sort of those four main branches, organic, inorganic, analytical, and phys chem. Uh, so you'll spend a fair amount of time with, in, with lecture and, and stuff on paper. You'll spend some time in the lab, uh, maybe do some, some work computationally. Um, I think that's sort of the biggest difference between chemistry as a science and chemical engineering. Um, science is just sort of exploring what things want to do because they do them naturally. A certain re a redox reaction occurs, a certain acid-base reaction occurs. It's inherent in the materials. Um, engineering tends to take science and apply that to some outcome and so create something from there. So if you take chemical engineering, you'll definitely need some basic chemistry. Uh, but you'll be taking other things that which are more applying what, what we already know to be true in these sort of engineering aspects. Thanks, Bronwyn. Uh, another question we have, would a biochemistry degree open up future opportunities to specialize in scientific fields such as toxicology or immunology? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, my, I myself, I actually started off as an immunologist, more or less. Um, Back in my undergrad, I did a microbiology degree um, and specialized in an lab that did uh, studied antibodies. So that was that was sort of my background in, into research. So yeah, often students take microbiology um, um, or biochemistry to get a better understanding of uh, immunology and toxicology. Uh, don't don't again, you don't have to. There are other ways, other paths you can take. Um, again, with AI and big data, a lot of these fields have uh, other pathways that may be related to math and stats and uh, data sciences that can also be connected to immunology and toxicology. Uh, so this is an interesting question. This made me laugh. What science programs involve the most dissections and animal experimentations? Um, I can give a general overview. We don't use animals um, in any of our studies unless they are absolutely required. And they have to get ethics approval. And I'm on um, I'm one of the approvers, so I have to look at what is the pedagog pedagogical reason for using an animal. And do you absolutely have to use an animal, or can you use a simulation? Can students learn um, that way? So again, it depends on what courses you take, what concentration. Uh, again, we're going to go back to you, Amit. <laughs> maybe you want to comment on that one. Uh, sure. Maybe I'll combine it with the last question a little bit. I mean, yeah. we have a few people that are using mouse models um, and, and we've got parasitologists here, you know, you know Galgan, the faculty of science who are studying the interaction of parasites uh, in, in cattle or, or even in some of the animal models. So there are access to animal models, but typically um, I'm not entirely sure what their location is, but maybe Nancy can answer. But there are some researchers who, who use different animal models. Um, here, uh, in terms of dissection and, and so on, uh, I'm not so sure. I'm not too familiar with our teaching programs. I don't think we do too much of that here. But yeah, sorry, it's the limit of my knowledge in this extent. All right, so we're getting close to the end time. So maybe we can go around, um, and maybe you want to talk about uh, what are two key skills. Um, will students gain when uh, they finish your program or if they do research? And how do you think those skills will help them with the careers and with life? So again, we'll start, we'll do the same. Amit. 
sorry, you dropped that first. Can you repeat the last question? Oh, sorry about that. Um, what are two key skills that you think students would gain from your program and research? Um, and then how would those skills help uh, the students in future careers and with life? I think the key skills that we really, really emphasize and we do an incredibly good job of, uh, particularly in biochemistry, which is an accredited program. So we have a, a certain standard, international standard to stick to. It's an incredibly hands-on experience in laboratory skills, which is relevant to any, really any industry, whether it's government, uh, healthcare, or industry. So I think that that's the major skill that we really teach all our students, uh, hands-on laboratory experience and research experience. Thank you. Leanne? Um, the key one for me is actually working on a team. Um, I know very few computer scientists who find work um, in industry or academia uh, who don't have to work together with other people. Um, you know, I can pull open, you know, like Baldur's Gate 3 and nobody built that by themselves in a basement, right? Um, so group work, I think, is highly, highly underrated. Um, and I think I still think it's going to be amazing to learn how to code. Uh, I know there's been a lot of talk about, you know, AI is going to do it for us. GitHub Copilot's going to take my job. Um, it isn't really because I have kind of a lot of expertise and experience and kind of know when those tools are are not giving me accurate information, right? Um, and, and so I think those are critical. And, and I think for a lot of fields, even if you're not going to become a computer scientist, you're still going to want to learn how to code and code well, so. And Brandon? Yeah, so uh, a couple of uh, kind of like transferable skills, and I think this is just not about programs in earth energy environment, but probably most science programs, if not all, uh, emphasize uh, kind of critical thinking and critical analysis of information. So we live in this information age in which, you know, there's a lot of social and political information out there. And you know, just being a, a better consumer and interpreter of that information that you might see in the news, things like climate change and mm -hmm. energy usage and different things like that, uh, being able to understand the science behind it. Um, another important uh, skill I think that's really important in our programs is uh, so kind of science communication. So being able to present your ideas clearly, whether that's in a, a verbal or a visual or a written format, and just thinking about some of the comments uh, from uh, Ahmed and Nancy a little bit earlier about kind of like unexpected career paths from science programs. I know that, uh, uh, you know, an unexpectedly popular career outcome from uh, sort of programs in geology and geophysics is going into sort of the business sector and investment banking, where the domain knowledge about some of the technical aspects of uh, geoscience are really useful for thinking about how to actually invest funds and resources uh, and, you know, make important uh, contributions in business and society. So, yeah, I, I just want to echo what uh, my colleagues have said before, you know, those analytical skills, uh, problem solving skills are very crucial. Um, and then also the communication collaboration skills. Uh, and to give you an example, it's not about math specifically, but I have a really close friend who has a biology degree and she is high up. Uh, in one of the banks and she had no business experience, but because of her analytical skills and her problem solving skills, um, she was able to move quickly through the company. She, she went for training for some of the business um, aspects of her job, but yeah, she rose quickly because of, as I said, those, those analytical and problem solving skills. I think that in natural sciences, especially two skills that are a little bit related uh, that you can develop are self-motivation and resilience. Uh, in natural sciences, since you'll be following two different disciplines at the same time, um, even as you make friends and, and, you know, experience things in certain courses, you aren't following a cohort quite as closely as people who are devoted to bio or chem or math or whatnot. It's not quite as much. Um, so, yeah, you very often natural science students, they they only really meet other natural science students by accident in higher level courses. Um, uh, so they will develop friendships and study, uh, you know, study habits sort of on their own as they work through their own chosen degree. And Matt, to wrap it up. 
Yeah, so I mean, in, in astrophysics, I um, I really think that that data analysis is one of the core skill sets that that comes out. You know, when you have have uh, databases of millions and millions of seemingly unconnected numbers, that uh, that ability to parse through it and actually select out which numbers are important and where their correlations are. This this applies to so many different disciplines. I mentioned the person I know uh, before that works in BC Health. But you can similarly uh, apply these skills to forestry, to fisheries, to to Stats Canada. Yeah. You know, the numbers are are basically discipline uh, independent. And so this is really one of the core skill sets that comes out of an astrophysics degree, but also creativity. Um, unlike a lot of sciences, uh, astronomers don't get to work in labs. Um, the, the universe only gives us light. Uh, we, we can't take a star and put it on a, a workbench and poke and prod and, and probe it. We have to just accept the light that receive that that we receive, and we have to interpret that. And so we have to get very, very creative in how to apply math and physics to actually interpret the light that we get from from the universe. And so I, I do find that astrophysics students have uh, have a very creative approach to problem solving, and that uh, that can can do them very, very well in uh, in many, many areas uh, beyond beyond astrophysics. Thank you. Uh, so just before we finish, I just want to express my gratitude to all our panelists and our chat moderators for making tonight's event possible, and especially to Ashley Tremblay, who's been running, who's behind the scenes, she's been running the videos, um, the slides, and she also helps keep us going and, and organized. So thank you, everyone. Uh, so finally, in the Faculty of Science, uh, we have a mantra. So I, I don't know if you've heard it already, but I'm going to say it again. It's called Get Science Done. Um, this is not just a call to action. So get science done means breaking down those barriers, whether they be intellectual, technological, or institutional. It means fostering collaboration across disciplines, as we've heard tonight, transcending the borders and embracing the diversity um, that fuels innovation. Um, the challenges we face um, are pretty complex, and it's through the lens of science that we can bring clarity to the complex and find solutions to the unsolvable and pave the way for a brighter future. So in every laboratory, classroom, field station, um, you heard tonight, observatory, community, we have individuals who embody the spirit of get science done. So these are scientists, researchers, students, explorers, and just every individual in society who has a curiosity about the world. You know, they spend countless hours in the pursuit of these answers. They are driven by an insatiable curiosity and an unyielding determination and overall a passion for making meaningful contributions to our collective understanding. It's because we love what we do is where success can come from. Um, so I would especially now like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules and join us tonight online. Um, so I'd like to say goodbye for now, but we look forward to the next opportunity to connect and get some science done. Thanks everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks everyone. Good night.